Do you know that Postgres can run JavaScript code? Today, we will figure out how we can achieve this really easy. But we will not just create a simple hello world function. Instead, we will run sort directly in Postgres. Let's get started. So what do we need to run a library like Sort or even our own JavaScript code in Postgres? Well, the first thing, of course, what you need is you need a Postgres database. Now, it doesn't need to be the newest one, but it has to be version 13 or later. Now, the second thing you need is the plv8 extension. So let me show you. We are here currently on the GitHub page of plv8. And as you can see, this is a v8 engine which runs in Postgres. So if you install this, then you will be able to run JavaScript code, which also runs on v8 in Postgres. Now, when we scroll down here, we can see in our readme file how we can install it. I won't go through how you can install it in detail because this will take way too much time, but you basically have to build it yourself and then you have to add the extension to your Postgres database. But of course, I will add a link to this GitHub repository in the description below. So if you're interested to try it yourself, just visit this page and they also have some really great examples what you can do with PLV8. So let's now switch over to our IDE and let's get started with some coding. So as you can see here, we are now in IntelliJ. And before we will figure out how we can run Sort in our Postgres database, let's get started with a simple example first, how we can run a simple JavaScript function. So to show how we can run like a hello world, I've created this hello.js.sql file. And let's now figure out step by step what happens in here. Now, the first thing what we do is we create or replace a function in Postgres. So we tell Postgres we want to name this hello, and it should take as an argument the name, which is of type text. Now, as a return type, we tell Postgres that we want to return JSON B. So this just returns a JSON object. You can make it return records of a table and much, much more. But if you're interested in this, just let me know in the comments and I will make a more in-depth video about this. But you can also visit the documentation. I will also link it in the description below if you're interested and want to figure it out yourself. But in this case, we'll just leave it with returns JSON B. And now what we do is we create this function here. And as you can see here, this is just a normal JavaScript function. We have this function here, which has just an argument name, and we return here a JSON object, which has a property response in there, and we prefix our name with hi. Now we return this in here, and on the next line, we can see one important step, because we tell Postgres that the language of this function is plv8. So we tell Postgres that this in here has to be evaluated by the v8 engine. Now let's see what happens when we create this function and then run it. So the first thing we will do is we will just run this and we can see here this completed in eight milliseconds and now it was added to Postgres. Now, when we have done this, we can now call this by using select hello and then we just pass it the argument. So let's run this here and we can see here we get a response for our hello function and this is just a JavaScript object. So this means, of course, you could also run this select from your backend or from somewhere else in your code. Now, of course, it's always important to think, is this the right way to go? Shouldn't we just create this query in the backend? I just want to show you that it's possible if you have certain use cases where you maybe need this kind of functionality on the database layer, or for example, to make your database more secure and add more sophisticated checks, then maybe this is something for you. But we have now seen here how we can do this with a simple JavaScript function. Now, let's dive a little bit deeper and let's figure out how we can run sort or another the library inside of Postgres. Now, what we always have to think of, of course, is we cannot just use npm install and then import it like you would do in Node or in the browser because we don't have access to NPM or to node modules inside of Postgres. And because of that, we need to bundle our code and put it inside of Postgres. Now, how can we do this? We are lucky because there exist bundlers like esbuild, which can take a library and just bundle it into one JavaScript file. So let me show you how we can do this. Let's open this index.js file here. And we can see here, this is quite small. We just have an import here where we import C from Zot. And then we have this line here where we say we use global this and we say the property C here is assigned to C, which we get from our Zot library. And this is everything we need to do in this file. Now we can use esbuild and bundle Zot into one JavaScript file. Now for this, let's open the terminal here. And what we now do is we just call npx 
ES build. And the entry point here is our index.js file. We say we want to bundle it and the output file should be called bundle.js. The format is an immediately invoked function expression. This means that when we run this bundle.js file, it gets executed immediately. We also want to minify it to make it as small as possible. Now let's run this. And I have already done this earlier. So we already have this bundle.js here, but now it was overwritten. So let's see what's in bundle.js here. So when I open this, this is just a file with one line, which contains the whole sod library bundled into this one file. And now what we can do is we can take this file and save it into our Postgres database in a table. So where do we want to put this? I have already prepared such a table and we can see here on the right side, we have this JS libraries table. Now let's open this and we can see here, this is a really simple table, which has two columns, the name and the source. Now the name here is the name of our library, in this case, sod, and the source is just this huge string, which contains the source code of our sod library. So this means this bundled sod library is now available in a table in our database. But what we now also need to do is we need a way to load our libraries and make them usable in our JavaScript. And for this, I've created this loader.sql file. So let's open this and let's go through these files step by step and figure out what this does. Now the first thing again, what we do is we create or replace a function and we say this is called require. Now you can name this whatever you want, but I found it a fitting name because we also use require, for example, in node. Now the argument it takes is the name of the library and it is a text. Now in this case, we don't want to return anything. We just want to evaluate our library and make the C object available in our context. So as you can see here, we now have the same approach as before with our hello.js SQL file. We now have here our our JavaScript function. So what are we doing here? We have just a function here with the name and the argument. And in here, we have something interesting. We have this plv8 variable. So this is available only in the Postgres context when we have our plv8 extension installed. You can think of this like, for example, a window in the browser, which is only available in the browser context. This is only available in Postgres. And this allows us to run some database queries. For example, we can use execute here and we can create a select statement. So what we are doing here is we select the source from our JS libraries table, where the name is the same as we pass in in our require. So for example, when we use sod as a name, we will get back a result set with one entry, which will contain the source of our sod library. Now, after we did that, we assign it to this const lib here, and then we access the first result. And from this, we access the source. Now for this eval call, always be cautious and always think what gets executed. But this is just the bundled code from the sod library, which will get evaluated. Because this gets invoked immediately, we will now have the C object available in our global context. Context. So by creating this function, we now have created a simple loader, which allows us to use the source of our sod library, evaluate it, and then make it available for further use. Now, the last step is, of course, we want to use this loader in our JavaScript function, which then gets run in Postgres. And for this, I've created an example here in the validate person.sql. Now, before we go into the code, I've created already a table. This is called person and it has three columns, a first name, a last name and an email. And of course, we can create constraints on our columns. What is the max length or set a regex or something like this to constrain what we can insert in these columns. But maybe sometimes you want to make a little bit more complex checks. And for this, of course, sod is great. Now, I don't say that you should or have to run sod in the database. I just want to show you what's possible so that you maybe have another tool in your tool belt when it's necessary. Now, without further ado, let's check the code. So what we do here first is we drop the function if it still exists and also use a cascade delete to also delete some orphan triggers, which are still there. But here on line three, it gets interesting. So again, we just say we want to create or replace a function and we call this function validate person. Now you can see here, instead of returning like JSON B or returning like a result set, we say we return a trigger. Now, what is a trigger? A trigger is something which gets executed in certain scenarios. For example, you can say a trigger should be called when an insert or an update or a delete happens in your database or in specific tables. Now, because we say we have a trigger, we now have special arguments in our function. Now, the first argument here, this is the thing which gets inserted or updated. 
updated. So the new value, which in our case, we want to insert or update into our person table. The second argument here is the old value, which was in there prior. But in our case, we are only interested in a new one, in the one we are trying to insert. But before we see how we can use this new argument here, let's see how we can load our SOT library. And for this, we will again use plv8 and we will use the find function method. Now we can see here that we can pass the name of the function and we can store the function inside of a variable. So I've stored it in the variable require. And now we just call our function like a normal JavaScript function and we say we want to require sort. This will then do a select on the JS libraries table with sort as the where clause and it will then evaluate the source. And because we've added the C variable to our global this, we now can access this variable inside of our function. So because of that, we now can create our validation schema in our JavaScript function in Postgres by using Zot. So as we can see here, we have this simple schema where we have an object and we say the first name has to have a min length of three and it has to have a max length of 20 and the same also for the last name. And of course, we also can say the email here has to have a certain pattern. So it has to have the email pattern. Now, after we've created this schema, we now call person parse. So we have this person schema here and we run it on this new value we want to insert because Postgres and PLV8 is really clever. It will give us this person record we want to insert as a JSON object, which we can pass to our parse. And of course, if this fails, then an exception will be thrown and we will not get an insert. Otherwise, we just return new. And when we reach return new, then this will get inserted into the database. Now we have created this trigger function. Now we also need to enable this trigger for our person table. So when I scroll down here, we can see here we have this create or replace trigger. And we say we want to create this trigger validate person. And we we tell Postgres we want to run this before an insert or update on the person table and we want to run this for each row. And at the end, we tell which function to execute. In our case, of course, the validate person. So let's now go back up here and let's insert this function into our Postgres database. So we run this here and we can see it was inserted. Now let's scroll down here and also create the trigger. And as you can see, it was also created. So as you can see here, we now have this insert here, which tries to assert a new record into our person table with my first name, my last name, and also with an email here. But as you can see here, this email is not valid. So let's see what happens when we try to run this. So let's run this function here and we can see we get an error. And in our console, we can see here we get the validation error from our SOT schema. We see here validation email, the code is invalid string and the message is invalid email. So as you can see, this worked as expected. We've tried to use an insert into our person table, but it was blocked because our SOT schema did throw an error. Now let's see if it works if this is valid. So let's say we have test at gmail.com and let's run this again. And we can see when we scroll down here, one row was affected, so it was added. So to see if this worked, let's open the person table here. And as you can see, the only record which is in there is the one with the valid email. The one with the invalid email was not inserted. So let's now go back into the validate person SQL. Now I can only talk for myself, but I find this really, really exciting. Now, of course, I would not use this on a daily basis. And of course, maybe I don't want to load like Zod in Postgres, but to be able to run your JavaScript or your compiled TypeScript code in your Postgres database without heavy configuration or doing crazy complex stuff, I find really impressive. But I'm really curious what you think about this. Do you find it interesting, useful, or completely useless? Or do you want to see a more in-depth video about PLV8 and what you can do with it? Just let me know in the comments. So thank you for watching the video. I hope you learned something useful today. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to stay up to date for the newest TypeScript stuff. And also let me know in the comments what kind of topics you'd like to have covered in future videos. See you in the next one. Bye.